one, two, three, four. Hi, my name is Mohammed Hassan, and I'm going to tell you more about equity, diversity, and inclusion at City of Kingston. Starting us off once more, that's Kingston's own The Meringues with the track Tell Me Twice from last year's YGK Music. Find this track and many more at cityofkingston.ca backslash YGK Music. Welcome to Tell Me More, the City of Kingston podcast. I'm Rob Hosier, your host and a communications officer here at the City of Kingston. To my left, physically distanced and sporting his Halloween costume. Really spooky, Paul. That is a podcast producer costume. Okay. His communications officer, Paul Whittingham, also with the city. And finally, behind the scenes is communications officer, editor, and journalist at large, Julie Lee Stitt. And of course, you heard from our guest at the top of the episode. That's all of us here in the Counselor's Lounge in City Hall, and thanks for joining us. Welcome back if you caught some of our first few episodes and if you have please like subscribe rate tell your friends all that good stuff wherever you get your podcasts in today's episode of tell me more we're going to talk about barriers not road barriers calm down all you road warriors out there today we're talking about barriers that don't just delay or reroute your travel plans in the most severe cases they can set entire lives off course they keep us from some of our better living better careers and better opportunities they're barriers with very real costs and they are experienced by people because of the color of their skin, gender identity, religion, age, political beliefs, the list goes on. Here to navigate today's topic with me is Muhammad Asan, the city's first ever manager of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and the voice you heard at the top of the episode. Before we bring Muhammad to the mic, though, a little context is in order. In 2020, we saw demonstrations in the United States, Canada, and here in Kingston calling for action to address systemic racism. In response, local community organizations and Mayor Brian Patterson hosted a virtual town hall on race and racism to hear from residents about their experiences. On the heels of this event and other conversations, City Council passed a motion to have staff review the city's policies through the lens of equity, diversion, and inclusion, and to hire someone to spearhead the initiative. Muhammad Hassan accepted this position with the city, packed up his life in Winnipeg, and moved to our limestone city. Today, Muhammad works with departments across the corporation and with the newly formed Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee to identify and remove barriers. And if you don't see those barriers or you don't believe they exist, please don't tune out. Lean into this episode. Our guest is warm, funny, and and he's here to have a conversation. He believes in learning through conversation and improving through kindness and collaboration. While the city of Kingston recognizes systemic racism as an issue, we realize some people may not. And so we're going to start today's conversation by tackling that bigger question. Muhammad Hassan, welcome. So, Mahabu, we're starting off with the uh, with no softball questions right off the bat. Uh, systemic racism is an emotionally and politically charged term, obviously, and yet some of us out there may still not know its true definition. Can you tell us what systemic racism is? Sure. Uh, s- systemic discrimination or racism uh, can be described as a pattern or behavioral aspects, uh, policies and procedures uh, and practices that are part of structures of any organization or any system, which creates or uh, perpetuates disadvantage just to racialize a person, person with uh, other intersectional identities like uh, 2SLGBTQ community, uh, uh, people with disabilities, uh, women, uh, neurodiverse uh, individuals and more. Okay, so it sounds like a, whether official or unofficial, a system set up to basically marginalize folks that may be a little bit different or, or maybe a part of the groups that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a system that is in place to uh, keep certain group of individuals out it's like a gatekeeping mechanism. I mean, in reality, there is no gate, but sure, uh, sure. Uh, but uh, there is one uh, virtual gatekeeping uh, that stops people from entering into the system and growing within the system. Uh, we normally talk a lot about glass ceiling uh, yeah. that stops uh, women uh, rising up uh, to the leadership positions. Mm-hmm. But then uh, th- th- there's a similar concept of glass walls that also stops uh, people from from entering the house, let alone growing within the organization. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And uh, and as, as you know, the city of Kingston recognizes that you know systemic racism exists. Um, but the, the million dollar question here is like, what do you say to people who may argue the point? <laughs> 
uh, I would say uh, look outside your bubble. Uh, right. You know, I have been living in my bubble uh, as an immigrant uh, for a long time where I never felt that I'm a different person or a different race. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the reality is different for many uh, black, indigenous and person of color. Uh, uh, and it's the day in, day, uh, day out uh, situation for them. Uh, so I think... Uh, when we say uh, su systemic discrimination or systemic uh, racism is non-existent, we are actually uh, looking at it from the perspective of uh, a very privileged point of view, okay. where we are not able to see uh, those uh, things because it's not directly or indirectly affecting us. Okay. So it's not it's not directly affecting me, so I, I assume it, it's, it's not there. Yeah, yeah it's like... Uh, I, I've I've lived uh, for a long time in Manitoba, so uh, it's like winter in Kingston does not exist for me because uh, <laughs> I am used to living in minus fifty. That, that is an excellent illustration. I was going to say that there might be some uh, some prejudice that uh, you were living in Manitoba, period, from an Ontarian or someone from the Kingston area or such. But and, and I think we uh, we excluded all of our uh, Manitoba or Winnipeg jokes from our intro as well too, so uh, you won't experience any of that too. So you went a <laughs> little bit into yourself so tell me tell us a little bit more about you what inspired you to take up the cause of removing systemic barriers to inclusion or yeah, I might be able to say who inspired you to take up this cause hmm. so I give my parents a lot of credit mm -hmm. for uh, giving me that I to see systemic barriers uh, growing up you know my, my mom was a uh, uh, a union person and uh, she was always at the forefront of cause uh, you know fighting for the the social justice wow. and my dad also used to get a lot of uh, you know get in a lot of trouble for uh, not falling in line oh, wow. uh, so we had always been uh, you know a very different kind of family uh, our extended family at times criticized us for not following these stereotypical ideas of how a family runs. Like in our house, uh, my dad used to uh, always make breakfast. My mom was not a morning person. Uh, so, uh, and it's not just that dad is making breakfast, but mom will always tell us that, you know, like it's not just women's job to work in kitchen. Uh, you know, another thing that I've always noticed is that uh, my parents uh, were always standing for the hard right uh, against the easy wrong. Uh, you know, sometimes they knew that they're going to get into trouble. They will be in problematic situation, but that did not change their perspective. So for me, it was always a very organic, inspirational journey to start seeing uh, the problems and start seeing uh, the gaps in the society and that led to where I am now. It's, it sounds like you got there. They uh, trained you to ask why. Yeah. Oh, yes. Or not just why, but also why not. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. B because again, like growing up, I remember like if I'm asking my mom, like, like, can I buy this uh, uh, game uh, and if she's saying no and I'm not responding with a why not mm -hmm. she would ask me to ask her ask me why not mm -hmm. uh, so that was very important part of my upbringing to not just ask questions but also seek answers with, with clarity mm -hmm. uh, but mind it it, it got me in a lot of uh, challenging situations. <laughs> and that's for another podcast, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. That could be a huge series. <laughs> well, Mr. Rebel Rouser, um, tell me more about some of the work your your small but dedicated team have already realized at the city. Because, you know, you know context-wise, you're, you're new arm of the city. You're, you're a new division within the city. Obviously, um, when we talked about the context earlier and, and where we, how we got to where we are now, um, it's, it's been a very, very short time since, since you've been there and since you formed a team and, and you've really gotten active at things. So with those expectations, what kind of projects, what kind of areas have you been looking at so far um, in your tenure here at the city? Well, 
uh, figuratively speaking, if uh, we look at the things, we are a team of two people in <laughs> EGI. But uh, uh, realistically, uh, every uh, member in uh, City of Kingston, the whole corporation is the team of EGI. Mm -hmm. uh, we all in our uh, smaller roles, bigger roles, medium sized role, whatever, uh, we all are playing uh, some kind of role in uh, building the equity, diversity, and inclusion of uh, our corporation and ultimately uh, making our city of Kingston more welcoming and more uh, diverse in many ways. Uh, I One of the biggest achievements for us is uh, uh, the Pride Parade participation. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about the fact that this was actually after a long uh, time, uh, people staying indoor. Uh, a social distance pride parade happened and lots of staff members participated. Uh, it was so great to see. Yep, and it was really exciting. Uh, and then of course, every department is playing their role, you know, like communications, uh, we, we have worked with a corporate guidebook uh, for communication so that, uh, you know, like, um, um, EDI uh, principles are reflected on all the communication that goes out from our uh, corporation. And also, we are currently working with housing and social services to ensure uh, uh, unhoused population and underrepresented population is uh, uh, present at the table and how that would look like. And, uh, you know, the list can go on and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like it's a division, too, that, that kind of overlaps everything, you know, um, where there, there, there's going to be an EDI perspective or something, a lens to look through at the EDI perspective or how it would affect this, this particular project in everything that we do. And so, yeah, I love how you put the fact that your team is of two core on paper, but really we have teammates all over the city because they're the ones that are, are walking the walk, that are, that are, are, are working in a way that is going to be EDI friendly. Yeah, and, and I must say that uh, my larger team at the corporation is doing a pretty good job in uh, letting us uh, pinpoint to special uh, initiatives and uh, allowing us to uh, improve and enhance their work with them. Absolutely. Collaboration seems just intrinsic to this work. And generally speaking, are people receptive to your input? Have you encountered any kind of pushback or anything like that? Sometimes like people may have fear of EDI or, or sort of EDI initiatives that you may be, you know, a police force to police everything that, that is going on and things like that. Is, is, is this the case? Um I'm, I'm glad to say no, that's not the case with the... Uh, uh, you know, passing out demerits, some EDI demerits as, <laughs> as, as people walk by. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, people are generally very receptive. Uh, I think uh, uh, as, as corporation, we are ready for change and, uh, and the change is coming from the, the leadership. Uh, so definitely uh, people are very deceptive. Uh, it's, it's not like, you know, like we don't want change. Sometimes people don't have the direction. So sure. our job uh, at uh, EDI office is to uh, guide them, you know, not police them, but probably the traffic police officer whose job is to point in the right direction. Sure. Uh, and and I I must say that uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, teams and staff members are very uh, proactive. Uh, okay. Like there there were a few instances where we thought uh, uh, we will take a while before we will pitch that idea uh, uh, to uh, a certain department. And uh, kudos to all these departments uh, like coming to us and telling us like, what do you think about? Uh, doing this with us uh, right. and I, I I can give an example of our finance department uh, in my work plan uh, uh, the um, social procurement was much later uh, in the next year but uh, uh, they uh, uh, proactively started working on it uh, even uh, before the end of this year so those are the positive things and that context, I think, is, is is very critical. And I think looking at EDI initiatives and EDI work that you're doing as a value add, getting the best out of people, getting the best out of a corporation, uh, is important versus a policing service or trying to catch people in the act or trying to catch people maybe, uh, that make mistakes around uh, around some of this stuff. I can say from experience living with a 13-year-old woke teenager, and I use woke in the most complimentary way way possible, I thought I was a very, very um, a politically correct person and, and very inclusive in my language and such, and she'll definitely call 
call me here and there on, on things where, you know, dad, you may not have, you know, considered this. And it's so great to see that that's just second nature, that younger generation. That is a true more policing system there where, where I'll get a, an eye roll or, or some penalty along those lines. But in this case, we're talking about um, accenting pro- projects, um, accenting and, and, and making uh, people and the organization generally better. Yep. And I think uh, just building on to what you just said, uh, our future generation has uh, uh, adapted to the concept of uh, EDI much faster than most of us. You know, like... um, I always say this, like uh, EDI uh, is is a bus. So uh, you are either on it or you are under it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so our future generation is driving it. To be honest. And speaking of it, in the sense of uh, an overall project per se versus a philosophy, um, which you can kind of take on many many different forms. At the city, a measurement of success is uh, whether a project is on track to meet its completion date. You know, milestones and, and, and completion. How many? What are the milestones, and how will we know we've arrived when? we've achieved our mission of removing barriers at the city of Kingston? You know, there will be uh, several solid and visible uh, changes uh, for sure. But let's be honest, uh, EDI is a moving target. Uh, Unless everyone's experience are similar, regardless of uh, uh, their their diverse experiences and identities, uh, uh, it's it's a continuous process. Like, you know, uh, women right movement in Canada, uh, you know, it all started by uh, uh, a a group of uh, women activists who were fighting for uh, voting rights. Right. Uh, But then... uh, after achieving the voting rights, the uh, movement did not stop. Uh, you know, now women all across Canada are still uh, fighting for pay equity uh, and uh, other uh, challenges. So it, once you achieve a milestone, you will realize that there is another milestone and and the more uh, needs to be done. You know, I, I always uh, feel that uh, people think that by achieving uh, this small milestone we we have done our job and now uh, we are the most equitable uh, <laughs> inclusive individual or organization but that's not the case uh, we cannot stop until there are no systemic barriers of any sort uh, which will take some time uh, and a lot of energy Absolutely. And it, it almost seems like we can uh, point to retroactive or, or uh, milestones in the past. Like you can watch an old television show or something that's on reruns on Netflix or something like that. And you, you think to yourself, man, that's oh, and you start cringing over some of the things being said, which were perfectly acceptable at that time. And they, and that was the peak of political correctness or, or the peak of, of, of EDI uh, influence in there. But yet, you know, even five years later, you're, you're cringing at some of the things being said. So it really kind of demonstrates that fluidity and that progression of this particular industry yeah and also it's related to uh, bringing people um, to uh, the, the so systemically excluded community members to the front and center of the stage uh, listening to their voices you know uh, one example that uh, is this classic uh, for Canadian population is uh, listening to our indigenous community members sure. you know like uh, it's not that uh, residential schools uh, is something uh, you know very recent uh, but uh, we started talking about it recently because we have uh, start listening to the voices of our indigenous communities. Uh, and it's not because we gave them the platform, it's because they took the front and center stage. Absolutely. So I think it's important to start listening to uh, diverse voices, uh, giving uh, opportunities, stepping aside and letting people take stages. That's amazing. And, and ultimately, I think everyone wants to do the right thing um, for the majority of, uh, of the folks out there and within the city, obviously, as well. And uh, they want to be an ally to others. And so broadening this out just a little bit, how would they do that? How would they be able to um, practice you know, a, you know, a good EDI philosophy and, and be an ally to others that may be experiencing some of this systemic racism? Good allyship is uh, being a good listener. If... Uh 
I'm not a good listener. I can never uh, listen to the voices of uh, uh, individuals or groups I, I claim to be an ally uh, for. You know, I can, now I can be passionate about 100 uh, things and 100 uh, objectives, but it's not about me taking the uh, front and center spotlight of everything. Allyship is mentoring people, uh, uh, guiding them to... Uh, enhance their experiences. So allyship is about uh, being quiet uh, and letting others speak. Mm -hmm. Allyship is about uh, just looking from a different perspective, you know, empathizing, putting yourself into the shoe of other person and trying to uh, read what is not written. Uh, trying to listen to what is not being said. Uh, so if we want to be a better ally, we need to start reading between the lines. Uh, we need to start seeing experiences from others' perspective. And if we can do that, that's the first step towards being a better society, better community, uh, better human being. Uh, because regardless of how different our experiences are, we all are in it together. Uh, and if we will have a more equitable, uh, inclusive society, everyone is going to benefit from it. Everywhere and obviously here in the city of Kingston. We can't really punctuate uh, our discussion better than that and uh, put a period on it. I know it's an ongoing discussion, but I want to thank you so much for this time with us, uh, for being so generous with your time, your work, your thoughts, and your guru-like uh, advice at the end there. We really, really appreciate that. We're so glad uh, we got you to move here from the uh, winter wasteland that is Winnipeg. Okay, Winnipeg, I got one dig in there. Um, and that you're working to identify the barriers that have existed uh, for so long that we can all kind of dismantle as a team, as a, a, a collaborative organization like the city of Kingston. And hopefully the next time we talk about barriers on the podcast, it's about all you road warriors out there. So thanks again, Mohammed. Thank you very much. Remember to subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a topic for a future episode, tell us more. Tweet at City of Kingston using hashtag Tell me more or send us an email at tellmemore at cityofkingston.ca. For more on this episode, visit cityofkingston.ca slash podcast. Tell Me More is produced by the City of Kingston's communications and customer experience team. Thanks for listening. Now, why not get involved? Get Involved Kingston is our online platform where you can share your ideas for making Kingston a better place to live, work, and play. Once you sign up, it's easy to follow and participate in engagement opportunities that will help shape projects, policies, and initiatives. Go to cityofkingston.ca and you can't miss it. Paul, are you involved? <laughs>